Fine, so more fireworks for the witness box. What would it mean for the jury? We have now a jury consultant, Joe Ellen Demetrius, Alex Ferrer, former Florida court judge and host of Judge Alex, criminal defence attorney Paige Pate, and Gloria Allred is still with me. Welcome uh, to all of you. And Gloria, thank you for staying with me. Joe Ellen, let me bring you in here. You're an expert in this kind of thing. Um, it just seems to me, it has done from the start, that in the end, this, will, this could well come down to this jury of women, predominantly white women, just making a personal judgment call as to whether they think George Zimmerman acted in self-defence and genuinely feared for his life or not. Is that how you're seeing this? Well, certainly that's going to be the bottom line in their reviewing each one of these witnesses that comes forth is that they're going to rely upon their own life experiences. And I think what was interesting about Rachel is that uh, for many of these people, uh, the jurors, they may have needed a, a cultural anthropologist to explain some of her responses, uh, but that's not going to happen. And the fact that maybe they were paying less attention to Rachel and more attention to the fellow today, I think goes to how each person, each witness comes through in the courtroom. So on balance, at the end of the trial, after they've heard all of these witnesses, they're going to look at who they think was the most credible and they're going to look at what their own life experience is in coming to an ultimate determination. Yeah, Pierce, I just want to say that I am very concerned because I now learned from your show yesterday that Rachel, in fact, had private counsel. Now, if she had a private attorney, then that private attorney really should have prepared her uh, for her testimony, should have helped her to understand the rules of courtroom etiquette, how to answer a question, how not to be combative with the attorney asking the question, how to give a clear answer. And I think she was very bright. She just wasn't well educated and not used to being in a courtroom. And I think she could have been better prepared. She was better prepared the second day. Did she talk to that attorney between the first day and the second day? I don't know. But I put a lot of responsibility on that person. Right. I mean, Judge, Judge Alex Ferrer. Sorry. Yes, go on. John. No, I, I totally agree with, with Gloria in that um, the way, the manner in which she came into the courtroom in terms of the attire she had on, I referred to that last night, the fact that we know that over the weekend and maybe even before she was tweeting information about here are my nails, these are my courtroom nails and oh by the way, here's the bottle of booze that I consumed. Any lawyer, lawyering 101 would have been for them to reach out to her well before she even became a, a witness in, in, in court this week and said, you know, looked at what her uh, social media footprint was and to say to her, stop, you cannot do anything further. That did not happen. And granted, the jurors didn't maybe necessarily hear that because they became uh, sequestered as of this weekend. But if there's anything out before this that they might have had access to, we have no way of knowing. OK, I'll be bringing in uh, Judge Alex Ferrahid. Judge Alex, what is your take on how the week has unfurled? The, the general perception seems to be it was all going pretty well for the prosecution, but today they hit the buffers a bit. Um, I think that saying that it was going pretty well for the prosecution is uh, a massive overstatement. This was a devastating week for the prosecution. At this point in the trial, it's the prosecution's case. We should all be going, wow, he did it. This is, he's definitely guilty. And then you get to the defense's case and it starts to shift and you start to wonder whether there's reasonable doubt or not. The prosecution is calling witnesses who make a point for them and make one or two points for the defense. You're, if, if anything, you, the doubt, the reasonable doubt, is as to as to the prosecution. It's almost like they're trying to create a reasonable doubt. It, did the MMA thing mean that he's on top? That that more creates a doubt than anything because the witness who saw him the best was Mr. Good, who was the closest, 15 feet away. None of the other witnesses saw colors of shirts or anything. The other witness who said that she, that Trayvon was on top was basing it on the fact that she saw a picture of him in his football jersey, which was the one that was, was when he was 12 years old, and said, "Oh, the guy on top was bigger than that." So this guy is seeing the color of the red jacket and saying he's on the bottom. The guy dressed in black is on top. He says that, tr that Zimmerman was screaming. He says, I can't swear he was screaming, but I could hear him like if he was looking at me and screaming and, tr and the guy on top was facing the opposite way. It would have sounded much more distant. When you put all of the bricks together, it's almost like the defense is building their self-defense case completely in the prosecution side of the case. It's been a disaster for the prosecution. 
Fascinating assessment there, Judge Alex. Paige Pate, what is your view? Because that flies against what many people have been saying, but what do you think? Well, I certainly agree that the defense had a great day today. It is not the common situation for a defense attorney to be able to use prosecution witnesses to prove their own case in the middle of the prosecution's case. And that's what's happening right now. I do think the prosecution had to call those witnesses, warts and all. You've got to get fact witnesses in front of the jury. You don't want to leave that for the defense lawyers. But all in all, at this point, the defense is well ahead. Oh, they, they absolutely had to call John Good because I'll tell you why. Under Florida law, there's a case called Amos versus State, which says if the defense calls calls a witness who provides beneficial testimony to the defense that the prosecution didn't call and knew about, that pro the defense can get up in closing argument and say to the jury, we have no burden of proof, but we had to call this witness because the prosecution was tailoring their evidence that they were showing you. State did not want that argument in closing, so they took their lumps by calling him themselves. And I would agree, but the state hasn't rested yet. I know we're going to hear some more witnesses next week, probably some scientific witnesses, technical witnesses, but I would be very surprised if the prosecution doesn't have a few very solid, very favorable witnesses waiting in the wings to testify toward the end of their case. You see, Gloria, Here's, I have a, a question. Here. Yep. Jonah? I, I have a question for, for the, uh, the, the legal analysts uh, on the panel, and that is, uh, there's obviously focus on what happened um, during the uh, during the fight. What? Why is the prosecution not focusing on the fact that Zimmerman uh, left left uh, to follow uh, Trayvon, and the fact that uh, people that are in neighborhood watch are taught by law enforcement three things: to observe, uh, to report and to be a good witness. You They're know, that, not that's, uh, taught that's, to take things into their own hands. That's, that's okay, a, Judge Alex? That's a great point. I was a former police officer, I'm a former police officer, and uh, we loved the neighborhood watch people to observe and report, but not to get out and follow anybody because things like this happen, either you get killed by somebody who is a dangerous criminal, or you accidentally do something to somebody who wasn't because you don't have the training. But the reality is, and people don't like to hear this, but it is the truth, leaving the car, following him, approach, even approaching him, which Zimmerman's not admitting, even going up to him and saying, what are you doing here, is not illegal. And it does not add to anything. What, what really, for the self-defense instruction, what really matters is the confrontation. When they came together, who started the aggressiveness of the fight? Who threw the first punch? And nobody can tell us that. At that point, if Zimmerman threw the first punch, he can't claim self-defense unless he made an effort to retreat. Even a person who starts it, if they say, whoa, whoa, I'm stopping, I'm stopping, I'm backing out, they try to retreat, and they are pursued, they can still, under Florida law, claim self-defense. But the getting out of the car, the following, and even not listening to the police officer, as, I mean to the dispatcher, as much as people think that that should be significant, is inconsequential when it comes to this because it is not a lawful police order. It basically is a dispatcher not wanting you to get hurt. So if you okay, well that's a fa fascinating assessment, Gloria. You're going to stay with me, so I'll come back to you after the break. Uh, to Judge Alex, Page, Page, Joanne, and Demetrius. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh, when we come back for.